Hello everyone, my name is Alex Dahl. I'll be presenting this paper on the secrets of the Bond Ball Mill Grindability Test. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge my co-author, Dr. Vladimir Nikolic from the University of Belgrade in Serbia. The paper will look at Bond's empirical ball milling equation and describe some of the conditions under which the test is valid and some conditions where the test is not valid. We'll be specifically looking at some corrections that can be applied to Bond's ball milling equation in situations where you don't have the proper feed size for one reason or another and situations where you need to adjust the product size basis. We'll be showing you some corrections that can be done to the, uh, to the test there. We'll also be looking at the Morel MIB number, which is a, an analog to the Bond Ball Mill Work Index, where Morel's MIB is used in the MI class of equations. And finally, we'll be looking at 11B value, which we'll see can be used as a quality control check on laboratory results. So Bond's Work Index is an empirical fit of data that was collected by the Alice Chalmers Corporation during the 1930s and the 1940s. People from Alice Chalmers were out in uh, mining plants all around North America collecting data on rod mills and ball mills and we were trying to come up with a laboratory test that could predict the grindability requirements, the specific energy consumption of full-size machines using laboratory tests. The key thing, the tests in the laboratory were empirically fit to the industrial scale machines. The equation that we use to convert the laboratory tests to a ball mill work index is shown on the screen. This is the metric version of it. There is also a a US short ton version of it. The key thing is that you measure a grindability number, that's the number of grams of product per revolution of the laboratory mill, and you also measure a feed size and product size, both a P80 and a P100 number, and what it generates is a work index that can be used to scale up uh, specific energy consumption equations to full-scale machines. The key message at this point in the presentation, this equation is only valid under the conditions outlined by the Alice Chalmers people like Maxton and Bond when you're running the test. So the feed to the ball mill apparatus must be prepared according to the instructions. It must be stage crushed down to minus 3.3 millimeters. And if you don't have a feed that course that, that it can be put through the stage crushing for whatever reason, then the classical equation that we just show you cannot be used. Another requirement of Bond's empirical equation is you must have a product size target that is close to what you actually measure in the test. You cannot extrapolate too far from the product size that the laboratory test was conducted at. Another requirement is that the apparatus in the laboratory must have the correct shape and it must operate at the correct speed. We're not going to discuss any of that in this presentation, but that is a requirement. Another requirement is that the ball charge must be precisely as specified. You must have particular amounts of particularly sized balls. And if you change the ball charge, then the test result you get is not valid. You cannot change out balls for some other shape and expect that Bond's equation for ball milling is valid. That is not correct. The final requirement is that the system during the test must reach a steady state. If for whatever reason the, the ore being tested does not reach a steady state, then the test has failed and you cannot predict a ball mill work index. Okay, so what do you do if the feed you have for the test is non-standard? 
So for whatever reason, you might have a feed that's too small to go through the stage crushing. You might have a feed that has a scalped characteristic or some other, um, other thing associated with it that doesn't match the stage crushing requirements. The recent publication by Dr. Nikolic, Tromich, and myself give you a procedure to change an F80 that you measure for a test with an invalid size. And the, the method allows you to predict what a work index would look like had you had a, a feed that was appropriate. So we're, we're trying to correct the work index to a feed of 2.44 millimeters. And that's what's described in this minerals engineering article. So very briefly, what the article describes is a database of grindability test work that was collected. And we ran a principal component analysis to try and come up with a, a, a curve, a description of what all ball mill work index tests should look like when run through the proper apparatus at both the proper feed size, which would be the blue points on this curve, and at feed sizes that are progressively smaller, which are shown in the red and the purple points on this chart. We also looked at some coarser material as well. The regression sh using the principal components was empirically fit. So the y-axis and x-axis values that you see here for the exponents, those are all empirically fit. So to perform the correction, you would run a test using that invalid feed. You'll measure the grindability, the grams per revolution, and the, the P80 that you get out of the test. And then you can load those into this equation and it will predict what the corrected ball mill work index would be based on a 2.44 millimeter feed size. So that's what this term represents. The 2.44 was the median of that big database that we showed you on the previous slide. You can also do corrections for the product size, the P80 that is measured out of the test, if for whatever reason you need to do designs at a P80 that are not what the test was done at. And this method was described by Joseph and Dahl in Prosim in 2018. And what it involves is measuring an exponent out of a series of tests that are done on a calibration set of samples, which you can see here. This exponent is then used on the rest of the database, on all of the samples where you only have a single test at a single P80, and it will correct the test using this curve that you measured for your calibration sample. So there's a couple of equations that you need to do to take your database and adjust it to a new work index. The first is that for each sample, you will calculate this K value using the product size that you received from the test and using this exponent, this alpha exponent that was measured with your calibration sample. Once you've computed the K for your test, the K is independent of size. You can use that now to compute a corrected work index for any product size that you desire. So you have a two-stage calculation here. You cal compute a K value for each sample, and then for each sample you can generate a corrected work index to whatever product size you desire. What we just described for the feed and the product size of the bond ball mill work index is also applicable to the Morel MIB uh, value. So the Morel MIB basically does in Morel's MI equations what the ball mill work index does in bond type equations. The Morel MIB is also sensitive to the feed and the product sizes that are obtained in the laboratory test. And the equations are calculated uh, using Morel's variable exponent. And that actually makes things a little bit more complicated. But fundamentally, we go through the same process we just described for bond to do the same corrections for Morel. 
So here's the calibration curve with the principal components computed for the Morel MIB to do a feed correction. You'll notice that the exponents here are different. So again, these are, are empirically calibrated to work with the Morel MIB equation. The Regression that we did on the principal component analysis gives you this equation where again you enter the grindability value measured for your invalid feed size and then you plug in the desired, beg your pardon, you plug in the measured P80 size from the laboratory test and that will compute an MIB value that is corrected to 2.44 millimeters just as was done with the ball mill work index. I'm not going to describe it in this presentation, but there is also a method to correct the MIB values to correct product sizes, and that's in the paper. The final thing I want to describe is the Levin B value. This is another value that you can generate out of the results of a bond ball mill grindability test. Levin developed this B value as part of his progress towards generating a fine grinding test using the Bond ball mill apparatus. Now, I'm not using it for, for that. What I'm actually using the B value for is checking laboratory test results doing QA. So I know from the big database of grindability tests that I've got that there is a relationship between the 11B value and the work index for ball milling. And if I can quickly throw up all of the tests results that I got from a, a new laboratory program, I can visually check and see that the results fit my expectations. So this is an example of a test program where the the Levin B values very quickly validate that the data entry done in the laboratory does work. Basically all of the points that were provided in the dark black and the green and the purple points line up with the database of gray points which is all of the other grindability tests that I've worked with. So you can use the Levin B value as a quick quality control assurance on your database of grindability tests just by visually looking at a chart of MIB versus ball mill work index versus a larger database. So conclusions. The ball mill grindability equation is not valid when any of the conditions that bond specified are changed. The equation that we presented on one of the first slides is not valid when you change the balls to some other shape. It's not valid when the feed is not prepared according to the specification. It is not valid if the product size varies dramatically in the test from what you actually want to do in your industrial design. In situations where we have an invalid feed, we can apply an external correction. It's a couple of extra equations that will then allow us to correct an invalid work index test to give us a simulated, uh, corrected work index. So we don't end up having to throw away tests that were done with an improper feed. Similar things we can do for the product sizes. There are ways to correct the product size. Everything that we've done for the bond ball mill work index, we can also do for a Morel MIB for people who are using the Morel MIB equations. And the last conclusion is that the Levin B value is a quick and useful quality control check that you can use to validate a large database of new test work that you got from the lab and just quickly see if there's any data entry errors in the table that they sent you just by throwing up a graph of Levin B versus work index points will be outside of the expected range in the situation that there was a data entry error somewhere in that table. So with that, I'll say thank you for your attention, and I'll say thank you to all of the organizers and committee members of the ProSimin Geomet Conference.
And thank you to you as the audience for your participation in the conference and for your kind attention. Bye-bye.